Ten-year-old Illinois resident Michael Myers acts as the film's main antagonist. He has a challenging life since he is introverted and odd, both at home and at school. Even worse, Deborah, his mother, is one of the most popular strippers in the area. This child kills and dissects animals while masking himself in a Halloween clown costume, which is one unusual thing about him. His beloved mouse is his most recent casualty. One day, when Michael is acting strangely, Deborah, Michael's mother, is cooking dinner for the family. It becomes clear that Ronnie, her lover, is chaotic, irritable, drinking, and hostile towards her. He insults Deborah's infant daughter, Boo, and young daughter, Judith. Every time Ronnie raises his voice, the young girl begins to cry. Michael enters the room while wearing a clown mask and declares that his pet mouse has passed away. His mother consoles him and promises to get another one, but she doesn't inquire as to how died the rodent. Ronnie asks the youngster to take off his clown mask just then, and when Michael refuses, he takes the mask off his face himself. Later on in the day at school, Michael runs into Wesley Rhodes, a bully, and his pal in the restroom. They humiliate him by making insulting comments about his mother's stripper career. Naturally angered, Michael starts shouting, shut up, as he fights the bullies alone. When the principal enters the bathroom and yells at them, the fight finally comes to a stop. But when Michael gets angry and swears at the principal, he gets into more trouble and all three youngsters end up being put in detention. Deborah shows up at the school right away, but instead of reprimanding her son, she rants at the principal and calls him irresponsible. The latter, shocked, helps her understand that Michael is a special kid. He even sets up a consultation with child psychologist Dr. Sam Loomis. Deborah is later shown proof of Michael's animal abuse during the session, and the doctor informs her that her son exhibits sociopathological traits. In Michael's school backpack, the principal apparently saw a dead cat. Additionally, a collection of photos documenting numerous animal mutilations was found. These, according to Dr. Loomis, are red flags, and only a disturbed mind could find joy in such brutal deeds. While running away from school, Michael meets the bully, Wesley, in the woods. He suddenly strikes him with a large tree branch. Michael takes out all of his rage as Wesley hits the ground and slams into him repeatedly. Wesley begs Michael to stop hurting him while crying in pain. The vile kid, however, merely deepens his aggression and kills Wesley. Following his return home that evening, Michael waits for his sister Judith to accompany his trick or treating. As she is about to go to work, his mother yells for Judith to take care of her brother. The latter still has no desire to go with Michael. Stephen, Judith's lover, arrives just as their mother leaves and they head upstairs to have some fun. Michael, who is now sad and alone, puts on his mask and leaves. But when he returns later, he discovers Ronnie, the boyfriend of his mother, dozing out on a chair. The devil child uses this as the ideal chance to execute his vengeance. In a fit of rage, he duct tapes the victim to the chair and then butcher knives him to death. After some time, Steve, Judith's boyfriend, arrives downstairs to prepare some sandwiches in the kitchen. Michael approaches him and hits him across the back of the head with an aluminum bat. Michael observes Steve for a moment while he twitches on the ground before hitting him repeatedly until he is dead. Next, Michael goes upstairs where he finds his sister Judith sleeping in her room. He removes his clown mask and dons Steve's large Halloween mask. He moves his fingertips on her leg as she turns around. When she finds Michael in her room, she becomes irritated and asks what he is doing. She slaps him when he doesn't answer. Michael kills his own sister by stabbing her in the stomach out of rage. When his mother eventually gets home from work, she finds him sitting on the front porch holding his baby sister. She urgently asks why he is out on the porch at this hour. Police sirens are heard in the background, but Michael speaks nothing. The next day, Michael is found guilty of first-degree murder and committed to the mental hospital under Dr. Loomis' supervision. Michael acts innocent despite the cold-blooded killings by saying he has no memory of anything. Deborah visits him once a week, but Michael seems to be growing worse. He continues to mislead the doctors for a few months. Michael shows Dr. Loomis the new mask that he created for himself during their session. His mother finally pays him a visit one day, and she tries to communicate with him. Michael, though, is silent and more alone than ever. In an effort to cheer him up, she shows him an old photograph of him and his young sister and suggests that he hang it in his room. Following the appointment, Deborah leaves the hospital while Dr. Loomis assigns Michael to a nurse's care. This proves to be a mistake as, when the two are by themselves, 
Michael snaps and stabs her to death. Deborah and the doctor learn about the incident afterward and are rendered speechless. Deborah in particular is completely heartbroken now that she knows what her son is really capable of. She later goes back home and sees old films of Michael when he was only a little, helpless child. She wishfully remembers the past while contemplating whether she was a bad mother. She ultimately commits a terrible act because she can no longer take the suffering. After then, the story skips ahead 15 years. Michael has grown into a huge man and is still confined to the asylum. Since his last murder, he hasn't spoken a single word, and now he spends most of his time creating masks. Michael's medical care has also been abandoned by Dr. Loomis, who instead wrote a best-selling book in which he describes Michael as an invincible evil. One evening, Michael is working on creating masks when two janitors enter his cell and begin acting inappropriately with a female prisoner. Michael continues working without showing any sign of reaction. Nevertheless, after the janitors have finished, he stands up, grabs one of them, and slams him against the table. Then Michael moves over to the other guy and repeatedly strikes him before throwing him against a wall. The guard, Ismail, who has been watching over Michael since he was a kid, is informed by the commission. Ismail enters the cell block shortly after and finds two distinct bloodied bodies strewn across the floor. He recognizes what has happened the moment he sees Michael. The beast cruelly beats him and kills him with a television set despite his attempts to lead him back to his cell. Michael leaves the asylum after the killing spree, eager to create further chaos. He gets into an argument with a trucker at a truck stop in the following scene. He repeatedly hits the driver against the wall before killing him. Then, Michael throws away his own and puts on the driver's cloth. On Halloween morning, the next day, Michael was back at his Haddonfield house. Since his mother passed away, the location has been vacant. When he gets there, he takes out his favorite butcher knife and mask. Meanwhile, Laurie Strode, an excellent college student from Haddonfield, is shown. One day, she receives an order from her father, a real estate agent, to carry some paperwork to Michael's home, the former Myers residence. It comes out that her father is attempting to sell the former Myers residence, which is thought to be haunted by the neighborhood. Laurie delivers the documentation there as requested before leaving. Unfortunately for her, Michael notices her and takes an interest in her. Then he stalks her while she's at college. Here, we learn that Lori is often lonely and that most of her time is spent watching over a neighbor's 10-year-old child. Her closest friends, Linda and Annie, are more appreciated and popular throughout the school, on the contrary. Annie persuades Lori to watch James later on Halloween night so that she and her boyfriend may go out and have a good time. On the other hand, Linda goes to a party at the former Myers home with her partner. The couple is noticed by Michael, who also happens to be present, he creeps on them. When Linda's boyfriend goes to the toilet, Michael attacks him and immediately murders him. Then he continues and kills Linda as well. As soon as Lori leaves for her babysitting job, Michael arrives at Lori's home and kills her parents. He moves on to Annie's place, where she is having fun with her lover, continuing his reign of terror there. After killing the man with brutality, Michael forces himself on Annie. After a short while, Lori and James arrive there and find the horrific situation. The body of Annie's boyfriend hangs from the ceiling, and she is entirely nude and trembling. Michael enters the premises all of a sudden and begins attacking Lori. The latter manages to escape somehow, but he quickly finds her and ambushes her. Michael's escape has been reported to Dr. Loomis in the interim. He rushes over to Haddonfield and begs the local sheriff to recognize that Michael Myers has returned and is a danger. The sheriff quickly phones Lori to inquire about her location, but she does not answer the phone. Then, after a little more investigation, he discovers the truth. Lori is Michael's sister, and she was adopted after Deborah committed the unimaginable. The doctor knows Michael is aware of this truth, which is why he has been following Lori around. Fearing that she will be the next victim, the doctor decides to pay a visit to the Myers home. Meanwhile, we hear that Lori is still alive, but she is confined. The psychopath drops his knife and hands her a childhood photo of the two of them. But Lori doesn't appear to grasp or remember anything because she was only a baby. While he is not looking she stabs him in the neck and flees into the backyard. However, it only has some impact on his massive body. Lori is then hunted by her psychopath brother, who eventually finds her in an empty pool. Fortunately, the doctor arrives just in time and begs Michael to stop. When this fails, he shoots the psychopath many times in the back. Following this, the doctor and Lori attempt to flee, 
but Michael mysteriously rises, blows the windscreen, and pulls her out of the car. He's going to kill her, and the doctor begs him to let her go. Surprisingly, Michael agrees and hands Lori to him. He takes the doctor and violently kills him by ripping out his eyes the next second. Lori grabs the revolver and flees upstairs while all of this is going on. The monster stalks her until she is cornered on a balcony. He then tackles her through the window, causing both of them to fall over the railing. Lori awakens on top of an unconscious Michael a little later. She then raises the gun at him and fires, but he gets up and grabs her wrist. Regardless, she is unfazed and fires several more shots at him. Lori, who is red in his brother's blood, cries wildly at the end of the film. Michael Myers has passed away.